Hi, it's Heather from Thicket Works, and today we're going to be creating this do-it-yourself gothic tomb with a faux marble finish. We'll also be creating this deliciously faded wreath, the easel that it sits on, these two columns, and the flower arrangements. Let's begin with the tomb itself. For this process, I'll be using Ready Board, which is the foam board available at the Dollar Tree. The measurements that I used are sized to fit the altered Darius mini coffin covered in an earlier video. You'll need to check the measurements of your coffin in order to make certain that the tomb fits it correctly. Cut two panels of foam board sized to fit as the base and the lid of your tomb. For this version, I'll be using panels that are 7 inches wide and 3 and 7 eighths inches tall. The walls of the tomb are 7 inches wide and 1 and 1 half inches tall. The ends of the structure are created from panels that are 3 and 3 eighths of an inch wide and 1 and a half inches tall. You'll find a handy list of all of these measurements and all the pieces that you'll need to cut in the description. The lid of our tomb consists of two layers, so we need to cut an additional panel that is six and five eighths of an inch long by three and a half inches high. To create the plinth or the slab on which the whole structure stands, we'll cut two pieces that are eight inches long and five inches high. Remove the protective paper from both sides of the foam core board. The lid consists of two layers, a simple rectangle with another rectangle mounted on top of it that has a beveled edge. I'm demonstrating cutting the bevels in real time without speeding anything up so that you can get a good feel for the process. You need a very sharp exposed blade knife like the one you see me using here and a metal straight edge to do this properly. Place the straight edge approximately a quarter of an inch in from the exterior edge of the material and then carefully angle your blade at approximately 45 degrees holding it in that position as you do a long slow smooth cut that should result in nice looking if not perfect bevels this minor detail will add lots of character and charm to your final build any good quality pva glue will work well to mount the panels one on top of the other. Take your time here and center that upper panel as best you can. Once you're happy with the arrangement, set the piece aside to cure. Now let's construct the plinth or the base on which the entire structure stands. It consists of three layers, two of which are the largest panels that you've cut and those are simply layered one on top of the other, again using a good quality PVA glue, and I like to spread my glue out in a thin layer using an old gift card. Next, center the bottom of the tomb on the plinth and allow that to cure. Next, it's time to construct the walls. I'm going to begin by fixing one of the long walls in place with a bead of PVA glue. If your wall feels slightly unstable, it can help to add barriers of one, two, three blocks on either side while the adhesive is setting up. Next, I'm adding the corresponding wall on the other side using exactly the same methods and cleaning up any excess glue with a dampened paintbrush. Then I'm fitting the end panels between those sidewalls and again, removing excess glue. Do your best to make certain that the structure is true and square, and then place a moderate weight on top while the glue cures. I'm using iron orchid decor molds to create the look of carved relief panels along the sides of my tomb. These decorative panels are being cast from air dry clay and then glued to the surface of the structure with a watery mixture of PVA glue. I'm just using a scalpel to remove any excess that overhangs the ends of the sidewalls. 
These castings are being glued in place while they are still fresh and quite moist. That allows me to finesse the placement somewhat and allow the castings to follow the contours of the underlying structure. By working in this manner, I can even blend together some of the joins at the corners. I've installed this beautiful egg and dart molding upside down intentionally so that the heavier thickness appears at the bottom of the tomb structure. That's helping to support the overall contour that I'm looking to achieve with this piece. Using thoughtful attention to proportion, we can simulate the look and feel of monumental slabs of stone, even in a small scale like this one. The simple elegance of this bead molding forms a perfect lip that will help distinguish the lid from the rest of the structure. The acrylic craft paint that's being used as a base coat here has a satin finish and that's going to make our job a little easier as we create this faux finish and then finally top it off with a layer of gloss. Base coating the entire piece in black will give us a good solid foundation for creating the faux marble paint effects that we're going to explore in the next section. So make sure that every bit of your model is covered with this base coat of black before we proceed on to creating that faux finish. Now there are dozens and dozens of ways to create a faux marble finish. And this is just my take on a relatively simple and fast technique. It begins with a dry brushed layer of mixed grays, and then it moves on to stippling cloudy diagonal shapes across the structure using a pouncing motion with a brush that's already been slightly mangled. The important thing here is to keep these areas of lighter grays quite diffuse and cloudy looking. We will add sharper details as we build up the layers, but for this first pass of dry brushing, make sure you keep everything nice and soft. Using diagonal shapes helps to impart a sense of movement and liveliness to the finish. If you haven't experimented with faux marbling before, I think that you'll find it's an incredibly enjoyable process, very intuitive. The thing to keep in mind is that we want everything to stay nice and soft and feathery as we begin building out our diagonal lines of lighter colors. Here you see me adding a thicker layer of white paint in the center of that cloudy structure. And now I'm moving to softer and more thinned layers of grays surrounding that white streak. Next, I'm gonna splatter the surface with some thinned down white acrylic craft paint. This will help to prevent me from creating a pattern that's too regular, something that's very easy for us to do as humans but allowing the speckles and dots of the splatter to help guide the placement of the veins ensures that I can't be too deliberate in what I'm doing. And that's a good thing when it comes to this technique. Use a very light hand when establishing your veins and then go back and smudge them out, allowing the shapes to recede into the cloudiness and then to come forth with more defined and vivid vein shapes. It's important to think of the surface of the marble as representing a moment of liquid flow caught in time. And that liquid flow consists of many different types of materials and minerals resulting in both translucence and matte areas, darkness and vivid brights. Most of all though, have fun with the process. And if you're intimidated by applying it directly to the top of your little tomb, don't hesitate to practice on some cardstock. 
It can be really fun to play with layering different colors and creating various patterns and textures with the paints. Just allow yourself to relax and use a very light hand as you playfully apply brighter and darker pigments across the surface. For this demonstration, I'm relying on the cheapest acid brush from my collection, and I'm using it deliberately to help you understand that it's not about having incredible specialty tools. It's just about using what you have and creating fun effects. Now, for the sides of the tomb, I am resorting to a finer tipped brush, and that's because I want these veins to be prominent against that contoured surface, something that's very difficult to achieve with the rougher bristles of the acid brush. Now we have the base layers for our faux marble. I'm going to turn my attention to the interior of the tomb for a moment and apply a drippy layer of soft white craft paint. Once the initial layers of paint have dried, it's time to begin glazing. And for that, I'm using Pledge Floor Care. Yep, you heard me right. This fast drying liquid will allow you to create layers and layers of translucent glazes that result in a glossy and nuanced finish you're going to love. Here, I've just mixed in some orangey brown craft paint and I'm distributing that over the surface in a thin layer. Next, I'm coming back in with thicker deposits of that same glaze applied along the veining that we've already established. Here, you see me using a small piece of sea sponge to dab on another translucent glaze, this one made with a light green craft paint. Be sure to change the position of the sponge often so that you don't get a pattern that's too repetitive. And I just love the translucent effect we're getting here. I like to dip opposing sides of my sponge in two different pigments. That way I can alternate and intermingle them easily. Here you see dark green and black alternately applied and mingled together for a glorious translucent cloudy effect. Next, I'm using regular PVA glue thinned with a little bit of water to apply some natural dried moss from my yard. And I'm adding more PVA and spraying it with isopropyl alcohol to help distribute the adhesive throughout the organic material and create a firm bond. I totally couldn't resist and I did add a touch of metallic wax along the edges of this upper marbled panel. The final coat is a full strength layer of pledge floor care finish. Just let that dry. To gently hold the lid in place between viewings, I'm using these micro magnets. You can barely even see them. They're so small and cute. I'm creating depressions in the upper lip area and then filling them with a super glue. Then it's just a question of separating one of these tiny magnets and placing it in each of these little depressions. I used a total of four of these micro magnets on the lower layer here. And that turns out to create just enough of a bond to keep the lid from sliding off when the piece is held up and tilted at an angle. Once the magnets are in place, I'm using a spray accelerant to help cure the super glue right away. And then I'm adding additional micro magnets on top of those that are already installed and then pressing down with the lid to create impressions where I need the other halves of these magnet pairs to be installed on the underside of the lid. A toothpick comes in handy to help guide these tiny little magnets into their final resting place. Now the lid fits in place and will stay there while the piece is picked up and admired. 
I just love that. So cool. Our gothic tomb with its faux marble finish is now complete. I'm loving the texture and the colors and the overall feel of aged grandeur that this tiny piece imparts. It was a lot of fun to make and I really hope you give it a try. Now, let's move on to the funerary florals. We'll begin the process by creating an easel to hold a funeral wreath. I'm snipping the ends off of regular wooden coffee stirrers and I've collected four of them here. That should give me enough material to complete the project. Once the ends have been snipped off, I'm simply sanding them quickly with an emery board. Next, it's time to split them down the middle, and this is easily done with a sharp edge and several passes. Once you've cut them in half, you'll want to create angled feet for the two front legs of the easel. Once you've cut them, smooth them back with the emery board. You'll need another narrow piece like this for the rear leg and also for the cross members. Once you've cut them, just apply a small amount of PVA glue to either side, rest them in place across the angled front legs, and allow the piece to cure. It can be a little finicky at this stage, so I find that a pair of tweezers can really help me get the kind of almost precise placement that I'm looking for. It's amazing how strong regular PVA glue really is, and it's a perfect way to apply a little chipboard trapezoid that's been cut to mimic the shape of the very top of the easel. This will provide stability for the entire structure. Using a hand drill or pin vise, create a tiny hole in the upper part of the rear leg of the structure and slide a small piece of wire through that hole so that it protrudes on either side. Apply a dab of PVA glue directly over the wire and allow that to set up for just a few minutes. Next, cut two tiny strips of cardstock that are sized to fit the width of the front legs. We'll be gluing these in place right over the wires to create an elegant, simple hinge mechanism. Once the glue has cured, snip away the excess wire. And now you have a working tripod style easel. To decorate it just a bit, I'm adding a tiny snippet taken from a soft but elaborate brass stamping and embedding it in a tiny dab of PVA glue. Once the adhesive has cured, it's time to add a priming layer of the same satin finish black acrylic craft paint used as the base coat on the tomb. Now let's make the wreath. I'm using a length of 16 gauge craft wire bent into a shepherd's crook shape at one end. The overall length of this piece is roughly six inches. Once you've created the hook, test fit it on the upper cross member of your easel just to make sure everything works well. And then create a 90 degree angle below the hook. This will be the start to our rounded wreath shape. Using your hands and the help of some needle nose pliers, create a circular shape hanging from below your hook. Hang it against the easel to make certain that you're happy with the proportions. And when you are, we can move on to playing with the flowers. I'm choosing to work with these miniature mulberry paper roses in a soft cream color. Because they're so absorbent, it's easy to tint the individual flowers with do-it-yourself coffee spray. And that's what I'm using as the base color here. The moisture also makes it easier to form the flowers into slightly more faded and, shall we say, withered versions of themselves. I've added additional spray inks 
and I'm diluting them slightly with more coffee spray, resulting in an aged and beautiful look. Once you've created about 50 of these, we can start building the wreath. Because these little roses have wire stems, it's easy to position them along the circular wreath form and give the wire a couple of twists and then snip off the excess. Concentrate on adding a single line of roses that extends all the way around the diameter of the wreath form. We'll come back and fill it in once we've hot glued this initial layer of roses into place. A heat gun will melt away any stray strings of hot glue that might remain. Here I'm using additional dollops of hot glue to individually place roses around the circumference of the wreath form. This will create an abundant double layer of blooms. Yep, that's just the right look. I added a few tiny dried flowers from my garden and the end result just pleases me completely. I love how faded and softly romantic the final look is. And our little easel functions perfectly. For a final finish on the easel, I've added touches of metallic wax and then a final coat of future floor finish for that classic Victorian black lacquer look. Yep, I'd have to say that our faded and romantic funerary wreath perched on its elaborate little tripod easel is a perfect accompaniment to our Gothic Victorian miniature collection. Now, let's create some columns to hold two floral arrangements. You can make these columns any size you like, but if you want to recreate the version that I've made, cut two long rectangles, three inches tall and three quarters of an inch wide, and then two additional rectangles that are also three inches tall, but these are 15 sixteenths of an inch wide each. Cut a total of eight rectangles in order to construct two columns. To create stable bases for these columns, you can cut a series of rectangles that can be layered. For the bases themselves, two rectangles, one and three quarters by two inches wide. For the upper layer of the bases, cut two rectangles, one and three quarters by one and a half inch wide. And for the very tops of the columns, cut two rectangles, one and three eighths by one and a quarter inch wide. I want these columns to look as though they've withstood many a winter, so I'm chipping out along the edges of the very base rectangles to create a look of stone that has started to crumble over time. This is easily done with a craft knife, just be careful, don't cut yourself, but apply that same distressing treatment to the edges of both of the bottommost rectangles that will form your bases. And then we'll layer the cleaner and not distressed rectangles on top of these aged bases. Now we can apply the rectangular columns directly to the bases using PVA glue and allow those to set up before continuing. The next step will be, of course, to apply the little lids or capstones to each of the columns. Again, PVA glue is our friend. Now, when I was setting the capstones on these, I ended up shimming one of them up with a little piece of chipboard. To hide the gap that that has caused, I'm using joint compound applied with a palette knife to fill in the void and then to create a bevel just beneath the upper lip of the lid and also at the base of the column. Allow the joint compound to cure thoroughly overnight is best and then you can sand it back with an emery board. Wipe away all the dust and begin creating a base coat. I'm looking for a rugged, not a smooth and glossy, 
stone-like finish here. So I'm using mixed grays with some hints of brown and a top coat that's sort of a light gray cream. And then I'm intermingling light green and black for a lichen-like texture. Again, I've gone to the garden and gathered some moss to create a beautiful weathered effect on the base of each of these cool little columns. Wire together some simple bouquets using the rest of your prepared flowers. I'm creating vases from this same metal stampings that we used to decorate the top of the easel. I'm using a sturdy pair of craft scissors to slice the design into four quadrants. Once those four quadrants have been established, we can bend them up two at a time in an opposing configuration, and with finger pressure, we can just create an almost cylindrical vase-like design. Super simple, super easy. Be careful, don't cut yourself on the sharp edges of the metal. Once the metal vases have been shaped, you can insert the bouquets that you've created using either hot glue or a ball of air dry clay, whatever you have on hand to help fix the bouquet in place. And then glue the whole thing to the top of your column. I'm very pleased with how these turned out, but they need just a little more detailing. So I'm using very thin, dark gray craft paint in order to paint weathering streaks onto the sides of the columns. I'll repeat variations of this streaking technique along all four sides of each of the columns, using a bit of the dark pigment to establish areas that might have that darker form of lichen as well. Once all these streaks of darkness have been applied, I will allow the paint finish to dry completely and then turn my attention to adding a slightly lighter color right over the top. This is a soft and translucent gray and it adds just one more layer of distressing over the top of the whole piece. So our columns are now complete and we have our funerary floral arrangements ready to take their place as part of the ever-expanding Victorian Gothic funeral tableau. It was so much fun to design, create, and then distress this mini Gothic marbled tomb along with the funerary floral pieces. Transforming humble materials like foam core board, cheap acrylic craft paints, and floor finishes into this miniature set of hauntingly beautiful funerary components has been far too much fun. Thank you so much for hanging out with me through the process. Until next time, bye.